parable of the growing seed, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, and though he, and though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So, this, this, this parable I just think was just, you know, really kind of struck me. And the first thing I learned was, we're the sower. You know, Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like, a man scatters the seed on the ground. We're the man. We we, we're the ones that scatter that seed. And what is that seed? The, the good news. It's the Word of God. So our job, obviously, is that we are the sower and we are to spread that Word. But God is the grower. That's the second thing we learn. Um, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. I love that. Though he doesn't know how. We think about it, you know, and... and um, uh, it doesn't even matter whether or not we get up. Once that's been spread, it's not our responsibility. You know, there is a process there. All by, the, all by itself, the soil, God produces growth. First the stalk, then the head, and so on. And we don't even really understand the process. So, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing. But what we learn is that God is the grower. In uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church in, in Corinth, and he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So it's pretty straightforward. You know, we can help, we can cultivate it, but it's God who does the growing. And um, I, I think the, the one thing that I'd like to, to really... Uh, to you know, again, this this illustration or this this really meant a lot to me when I saw this. Um, when you when you think of and I passed out cards. When you think of Vincent Van Gogh, what do you think of? His paintings. His paintings. Most everybody says, yeah. There you go. The, the ear. Everybody knows about the ear. So there, as a matter of fact, is a painting in the self-portrait with bandaged ear from 1888. So, but what we don't realize, what most people don't realize about Van Gogh was that he was a very spiritual man. In fact, he spent, um, in 1878, he got a six-month assignment with the Dutch Reformed Church to be an evangelist. And he actually went to a small Belgian mining village as an evangelist. And what he did when he got there was he began to set himself apart from all the other evangelists that were there, um, that had been there before, he began to set himself apart. He basically gave away all his possessions. He gave it all to the, to the miners who were in greater need than he was. He ended up sleeping on the floor on a mat um, because he gave away all his furniture. He got in trouble with his landlord because he cut up all his uh, linens to use as bandages for the, you know, for the miners who were injured in, in uh, mining accidents and things like that. And uh, so uh, it was really... Um, an amazing thing, he, he really developed a relationship with those miners. And when there was, where there was trouble with uh, um, uh, labor trouble between the miners and the owners of the mine, as you know, it seems like there inevitably would be, um, he was the go-between. He was the one that they trusted. In fact, they began calling him the Good Samaritan. That was his, that was his, his uh, nickname that they called him. But the amazing thing is that the church rejected him. The church said, no, 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 you're, you're just too far out there. You can't, you can't do this. You have, to, you, know, you have to live by example. You have to have a higher standard. And he's like, you're thinking, you know, hey, I am providing an example. You know, I'm being Christ to these people, but no, they, they rejected him. And that actually, they pulled his support, and he was done as, a, as an, an evangelist. And that really was part of what started his, his downward spiral. In, uh, in this same time frame that, that we're talking about here, that's when the art of photography was first coming into place. And I know my son Mitch would, would argue this point, but according to Van Gogh, it was like a lifeless art form. He hated it. It was, it was um, flat and lifeless, and, and it basically just pre presented reality. And what Van Gogh wanted to do in his paintings was to pre present the reality that wasn't necessarily available to the you know to your eye that you could normally that you could see and the way he did that was with color so when you look at his paintings he used just deep rich colors that provoked a lot of 
emotion in things. And the color that he used the most, or that he loved the most, was yellow, because he used that to represent the love of God. The warmth of God, the love of God, he used his, when you see his paintings and you see yellow, it's likely that he's trying to convey the love of God. So in fact, an example of that here is his most famous painting, Starry Night. Uh, most everybody's seen this painting, but what I didn't know about it, and which is, it is quite amazing to me, is you know you see the stars and, and the moon, you know projecting that that yellow, that that love of God, the warmth. You can see this is oh, I, I got a pointer here. You, you can see these are little shacks. These are the miner shacks. The one building in the center of the thing that does not have light is the church, because he felt that the love of God wasn't there. Isn't that amazing? This is a, a, a painting by uh, Millet, who is a French painter, and it was done about 1850. And this painting actually impacted Van Gogh amazingly. He really loved this painting. And he actually copied this character and used him in some 30 of his own paintings. Um, and what you see here is this, is this sewer is really the central figure of this painting. He's right out there in front. This is what causes, you know, or this is, you know, when you're talking about growth of, the, of agriculture or whatever, the sower, he's the, he's the main man. But when you look at Van Gogh's sower, you see a different picture. And again, this is, this painting just, this is what really struck me. You know, the sower is there and you can see he's almost the identical character as as the one that we just saw before, but look, he's off to the side. He's a minor part in this thing. And it's hard to tell in this light, but you can see he's, he's sowing the seed, he's got a smile on his face, he's happy, he knows what he's doing. But in the back is the love of God. And you see up here, there you go, thank you. Um, which is, whoops, I hit the wrong button, there's too many buttons here. Right up here, closest to the love of God is the harvest. So the harvest is there, closest to the love of God and the warmth. So to me, this was just a perfect, you know, a perfect expression of this parable that, that we were just talking about. There's an example, though, um, from, from our lives. Um, this is a story that Dave ha has told. Um, but they were in Uganda, and um, uh, he was with Jos Holthausen, who was the founder of Christ Hope. They were sitting in a cafe, and this uh, young man came up to Yos and said, excuse me, are you, are you Uncle Yos? And uh, he said, well, yes, I am. And um, uh, the young man said, well, I just wanted to tell you that several years ago, you came into my village and you and your wife, Sylvia, presented Choose to Wait. And at the end of that Choose to Wait conference, uh, I signed a pledge card which said I would, I would remain pure until... I was married, and then after marriage, I would remain faithful to my one wife. And I just wanted you to know that I have done that. And another thing that you did was you put your hand on, my, on me and you prayed. I pray that God will use this a thousand times over in your life. And I wanted to tell you that since that time that you came to my village, I have actually done Choose to Wait. I've taught Choose to Wait many times using that same material. And over a thousand young people have signed up signed that pledge card. And so there you see the exact parable of the sower um, played out in, in Africa with, you know, giving that choose to wait message, the good news of Jesus Christ and his plan for our life. And you see how that's just used over and over and over. So there was a, a good example. So now what? Well, it's our duty to sow the seed. Um, it's pretty clear that when the seed is sown, there's a whole, whole bunch of different possible outcomes. And um, I guess the amazing thing and the nice thing to know is that we're not responsible for those outcomes. Um, we have to trust God. And so we trust God. Um, God is the grower. We are the sower. Have hope in the power of God's word because that is how we, we are saved. And discover the humility of the sower. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, that we need to stop judging ourselves and judging others by the outcomes that really rightfully belong to God. And um, really abandon the outcomes to God. And just basically, you know, I'll sit back, 
make sure we sow the seed, but then just marvel at the work that he does.